ability to spend probably seven to eight figures in marketing to hopefully enter in a top grossing. The top grossing hasn't moved for years. There's no new entrance. And that's not good, a market where there's no new entrance, right? But here's the catch. Sebastian Bourget, the co-founder and CEO of The Sandbox. A unicorn online gaming platform that offers a unique and immersive gaming experience. The Sandbox started in 2011 as a mobile game where people could make 2D games and creation, like music, pixel art. It then became a large success, driving 40 million downloads and 70 million player made creation. In 2017, we started to make Sandbox on blockchain. We talked a bit about NFTs. Mm -hmm. Are NFTs dead? I think NFTs are far from dead. Cryptocurrencies are a store of value. NFTs are a store of culture. Saying NFT is dead is like saying culture is dead. If you talk about trading activity, there's still a large volume of NFT being traded. We just have to keep educating developers and creators on how to best utilize NFTs to attract users. Why is the concept of digital identity something that is so important to you? Studies show that more than 54% of people who have an avatar on Roblox, Fortnite, or Sandbox feel more themselves than in a physical world. And this is where it gets scary. What do you think is the right way to create a valuable NFT community? I think there is... 75% of you that watch this channel frequently do not subscribe. If you like this show and think it provides value to you in your crypto investing journey, can you please, please, please do me a favor and subscribe to this channel? Hit the like button and leave a comment below. It helps this channel more than you can imagine. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests, and the better the conversation. Thank you. Today's conversation is supported by Jupiter, the most used decentralized exchange in crypto and the largest DEX by volume on Solana. Mantle, a leading Ethereum layer 2 with more than $2 billion in total value locked and $3 billion in liquid treasury. And Astar Network, a scalable network connecting people to Web3 through entertainment, blockchain development, and community events. So Singapore, yeah? So you've been there a couple of times? Yes. Yeah? yeah. Are you going to talk in 2049 for this Singapore? Year again? A yeah. few years back. So actually for a story, like when we were originally fundraising for uh, the Sandbox back in 2018 and 19, Singapore and Token 2049 was the first uh, big conference that we attended. We met a lot of investors for Sandbox. Yatsu was there and uh, uh, I was there as well. And um, yeah, it really gave us a first insight around like the whole crypto side of universe. And I came from like mostly gaming. Mm -hmm. So it's been a, a nice, I think I met CZ back then and a few other of the uh, OGs. It's been interesting. So before 2018, you were not really familiar that much with crypto? No, I was, uh, but um, I wasn't maybe less involved with uh, Asia. So uh, mm. like walking back a little bit, like the story of Sandbox, like Sandbox started in 2011 as a mobile game on iOS and Android, where people could make like 2D uh, games and, and creation, like music, pixel art, uh, electronics, and uh, playing around with uh, physics and the periodic table of element, then they could add more and more uh, game element and share those creation online, become a large success driving like 40 million downloads and 70 million player made creation. But still we were kind of struggling to keep and retain those creators engaged for a longer time, more than a few uh, months or years. Mm -hmm. Essentially like featuring them for like social fame, etc., wasn't sufficient for them. And we couldn't share a form of revenue that they drove because they contributed with their content to the success of the game. Uh, and we found in 2017 blockchain with the first game crypto kitties uh, that use nfts and those virtual cat as nfts were exchangeable outside of the game uh, you uh, could buy it from other players on the marketplace open sea sort of ebay of digital asset and using uh, crypto as a way of payment and we found it to be the solution to that problem of monetization for our creators and that's oh. when we started to make sandbox on blockchain why could you not initially share revenue with the creators? Well, what was the problem? With the um, well, the problem is like with platforms. the web two yes, game. Yes, so, uh, like when you develop a mobile game, you need to publish it either on the App Store or the Google Play Store, and all those platforms. Like yes, you users can make a payment with their credit card, uh, so you receive they purchase like. Uh, 
in-app purchase, virtual item, virtual mm. content, and you receive a fiat payment at the end of uh, 30 days, 60 days from Apple or Google. But you don't have a way to send a payment back from uh, yourself as a developer towards certain users on the platform. So you have to find manually like who those users are, write them a contract and like just like make your own private arrangement which is not scalable basically and like very uh, tedious like the remand uh, so, requires a lot of manpower so, so so the criticism that hey gaming developer are basically keeping all the money for themselves in web2 is actually not that true it's no, more um, that it's not scalable and it's extremely difficult to do at scale and the only probably the only moment where you have some in like serious or interesting money to share is when you have reached a certain scale, but it's not scalable to give this money back. Well, the traditional business model in Web2, and specifically um, uh, mobile gaming, is like this free-to-play model. Like you have uh, the platform, which are acting as like the distribution channel for the application, and they take a fee which range from, now it's like 5 to 10% in certain case, up to 30% as a standard fee on any single purchase or payment made by users on those platform. Developer then normally keep the rest of the revenue. However, they still have to bear their own marketing cost and user acquisition cost. The user acquisition cost, usually they have to spend on advertising, traditionally on the app stores themselves or on Instagram, on X, on YouTube, etc. to drive user in, convert a certain number of those users um, to download their application and after like hopefully convert 3% that's the industry average into paying users and then retain those users for sometimes many years so that they keep purchasing on a regular basis until like they uh, like the cost of acquisition the CPI mm -hmm. is actually lesser than the revenue generated by those users the LTV so this equation CPI versus LTV has really been the de facto standard for the industry. But today, traditional model of CPI versus LTV is very challenged and the whole gaming industry is confronted with an unprecedented like um, situation where like they can no longer acquire targeted users as they've done before. Because like now new privacy laws are in place, mm. the stores and the platform cannot collect any more specific data about those users. And hence, like you cannot target as efficiently like, oh, I want a game for a casual woman between 25 and 45 years old in the US because I'm doing a simulation and management game. Meaning that the cost of acquisition have risen and Unfortunately, the economical context as well of the world, inflation, war, people are spending less, spending less in entertainment. So the LTV are decreasing. So a CPI are rising, LTV are decreasing. It's, it's getting more and more challenging to become profitable operating with this model. Many studios are forced, actually, we've never seen as much layoff in the industry since the beginning of the year readjusting workforce post-COVID. And those studios are forced to look at new models because what they used to, to do and to apply for this recipe that they applied for over a decade no longer works. And Web3 brings a new solution, brings an opportunity to reinvent the model, to distribute the value between the different actors of the value chain, like the players, the developers, and the platform in a more fair way. And more importantly, to reinvent this monetization model, not necessarily trying to charge only, uh, to monetize only 3% of the user base and the rest with targeting advertising and collecting user data to sell it uh, or to the platform, for example, but instead to think of like how we can involve the community to participate more openly, become stakeholder of the economy of the game, uh, how we can airdrop or distribute content for free initially to drive the community. And also how like the monetization is not only on like selling constantly new model, making the new content, making the previous content kind of like obsolete, but uh, only selling limited scarce, scarce supply of content, growing its value, and then maximizing uh, the time, the number of time that users are going to uh, exchange with each other like selling to each other those content and taking a small fee on every transaction, the royalties model. That's really interesting, 
but it requires some education, some adaptation, Absolutely. some experimentation until we find the next like uh, major model that will emerge in Web3 and become probably one or easy main recipe that a lot of gaming companies will follow. Does it mean that it's almost impossible for a new Web2 game to launch and be profitable? I think it's get, the it's barrier to entry is get, definitely getting higher. We know that if you want to enter uh, with your uh, game studio, not only you have like the production cost of your game, but now like you need to spend probably seven to eight figures in marketing to hopefully enter in a top grossing. The top grossing hasn't moved for years. There's no new entrance. And that's not good, a market where there's no new entrance, right? It's not good, but you could argue... The main question is the big Web2 gaming players, are they incentivized to keep this as is or do, are they also forced to explore Web3 because even themselves could benefit much more than staying in this kind of oligopolistic situation? I think like the new uh, studios, new creators entering the space will be more agile in experimenting and will be Uh, like definitely best fitted to like adopt web free, test an experiment and hopefully grow and become the new leader in the space. We've seen that in the past. Every time there's a new platform, the one that already established are probably the last one who are going to enter and mm -hmm. be forced to migrate. Why is because for them, the revenue opportunity, even if you can earn five, six figures, seven figures in web free, if you operate your game well, This is not sufficient. That's what they earn on a daily basis in Web2. So they have no real opportunity yet to, to risk their existing model. The way that some of them have been doing, because I'm also the president of the Blockchain Game Alliance, we count 600 members. Our mission is to educate about like how blockchain technology can like really empower the video game industry and drive new use cases. We have some members like Atari, uh, Square Enix, Ubisoft, um, The few Korean studio uh, as well, we made uh, Netmarble, etc. They are establishing new entities to experiment with Web3. But those new entities, they cannot behave like startups. They do not like follow the same rigid corporate structure of thousand big kind of like those Web2 um, companies, and that allow them to be more agile in like experimenting games and to be more creative as well without like really um, having to worry too much uh, on, on what the rest of the company does. So you said the sandbox started in 2011, right? As a Web2 game. Yes. Then you had some challenges and then you discovered Web3. And then you jumped on the opportunity. Does it mean that you were, I mean, a certain size, but not big enough yet to make the take the leap? Or just that you really understood how this thing changes the game and just jumped on the opportunity, right? And you did that by associating with Animoca. So why did you do that? And I think the most interesting thing is what happened afterwards mm -hmm. for the sandbox. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Like, I think we were really quite successful already. Like, from the first months that we launched Sandbox back in 2011, we already got one $1 million dollars and probably $1 million dollar revenue back then. And over time, the company made three, four million dollar revenue a year, which was reasonable, like, put us as a top 500 uh, gaming studio around the world. Um, And we were excited to be able to keep developing with live ops, uh, like regular update of content, adding new elements, new capabilities. And our mission has always been like how we empower anyone to become a creator. So back then, blockchain didn't exist. So there was no question. Like the only way to like become successful and grow was to keep improving and iterating between 2011 and 2000, almost 17, 18 what we were doing. We were knowing our limits, but we were improving and doing better what we were already doing. Usually in a mobile uh, free-to-play market, the way to grow your revenue, it's either like you spend more in user acquisition and you maximize this CPI versus LTV equation, or you look for new market and specifically publishers. If you publish in Asia, Like uh, we were very good with US. US was probably 80% of our audience, but we didn't have like presence in Japan, in Korea, in China, we were, which were like the other top five markets. 
So that's how we actually approach Animoca brands. Starting 2014 and then uh, I believe uh, 16, we met a few times. We were looking for a publisher for the sandbox in Asia. And back then, Animoca brands was not a blockchain company either. They were like a uh, game studio of 100, uh, 100 people publishing Western game to Asia or licensing big brands from Asia to add them to Western games, which was a perfect fit for Sandbox. We wanted to work on bringing like uh, Blackjack and from Osamu Tetsuka or Doriamon as IPs and allow people to make their own games with them. We didn't work together back then, but we kept like meeting uh, with Yatsu and Robbie, uh, the co-founder of Animoca over the years. We updated each other until 2018 and we, we figure somehow like we are both interested into NFTs and CryptoKitties. And Animoca brand became the publisher of CryptoKitties in China, where we were implementing NFTs in Sandbox to empower those creators to own and monetize their creation. So at that point of time, it really made sense to work together. And actually that led toward the acquisition of that game studio by Animoca Brands. And um, moving forward, like we not only they acquired that studio, but we spawn out Sandbox at its own uh, separate product and, and company. We raised fund in 2019, $4.5 million with Animoca Brands, Hashed, which is leading in crypto investor from Korea, had, uh, True Global Venture. I had Ryan ah, uh, on the podcast last yeah, week. Yeah, they were one of the first to believe in the thesis yeah. of blockchain gaming and Sandbox and Ox Infinity were the Absolutely. two projects that yeah. they backed back then. And they brought us to Korea, yeah, and I'll get back to there after. And uh, Square Enix from Japan and True Global Venture, uh, well, very international investor uh, as well. And interestingly, when we saw that, we said, look, like all our investors are based in Asia. There must be something that Asia is understanding much better around like web free, blockchain gaming and metaverse than us trying to pitch and convince people a traditional way, raising funds in the Silicon Valley, explaining about NFT and web free. So that's where we decided let's double down and working with Hash, we started to implement uh, uh, our first team in, in Korea. That's, and that was a very uh, successful attempt since we were able to sign a lot of like local partners, brand. Uh, we, uh, we have like what we call the Kverse in Sandbox and we already did Kverse 1, 2 and 3 giving the amount of like brands from K-pop, whether it's SM Entertainment, Cube Entertainment, uh, we have Studio Dragon, we have Netmarble, we have A-Story, Attorney Wu, and a few exciting content that are part of Sandbox and use our platform to build experiences that engage their audience, allow them to uh, also become creator using our no-code game maker. Uh, and afterward, like, of course, we expanded in Hong Kong, we expanded in, uh, uh, in Singapore as well, where you base off, and uh, Thailand um, and Japan. So Sandbox now um, is like, uh, counts 5.7 million users account with a wallet, which in Web3 is, is becoming a significant number. We have over 800 partners around the world and 400 major brands, and Asia represents 35% of them of players, of our creators, our brand, and landowners. So it's quite exciting. What's the plan for the future for the, for the Sandbox? So we still see Sandbox as an alpha uh, in terms of like uh, product mm -hmm. maturity. We've been building it for roughly three, four years now. We always started by the product for the creators, and today we're still very creator-driven. We released uh, the 3D editor, Vox Edit, so people can make their own content and animate it. We release the marketplace, so now people can mint their own asset on Polygon and start selling them since last December. We have our no-code game maker that keeps being updated every quarter. Uh, actually, we had a major release last at the end of uh, last year, and today a new big release as well. Like the community is super excited about it. Uh, we open the publishing, so any of the twenty seven thousand unique landowners of our map can now publish their experience, and uh, we just passed a thousand experiences live by creator. So again, like a very exciting milestone that shows that like there is a lot of traction on the user generated content side and like the supporting and empowering the creator economy with Sandbox. And the more you provide them with tools that uh, unleash their creativity, allow them to make fun games, multiplayer games, add their own rules of gameplay, the more diversity of content you have. Sandbox will probably uh, enter the beta phase this year, 
with more product updates, with the upcoming season four, that's uh, a lot of content from both IP, IP brands and users of content, major partnerships to be announced. So very exciting brands, um, you know, entertainment brands. I, can't, I don't want to spoil it, but it's very exciting. New markets developments, like we started Vietnam, we're here in Dubai, uh, I'm going to Saudi Arabia after, so we keep on boarding. Uh, local partners and developing the creator economy there. And ultimately, next and uh, this year, the launch of the DAO as well, so it's coming. So allowing um, landowner and sandholder to participate in the governance of Sandbox and support various initiatives to grow this ecosystem. And later next year, I think like Sandbox will launch the public 1.0 version, it will also be available on mobile, and we'll start seeing like probably a... Uh, uh, an acceleration of the growth phase, both from the creator side and the player side. The central piece of all of that is NFT. This um, in sandbox, yes, you have like the NFTs, so various kind like the lands, virtual real estate is an important aspect of sandbox with our map. You have the avatars, which are really the uh, the entry point for anyone who wants to enter the metaverse, and it serves as their digital identity. They are, each one is unique. They, we have 19 collections live uh, between uh, 1,000 to 10,000 unique supply uh, based on your favorite IP or celebrity, Smurf, Rabbits, uh, uh, Snoop Dogg, Steve Aoki, Paris Hilton. Uh, you can use them. And we also uh, support uh, external collection to become interoperable. Like with this idea of open metaverse, I can have NFTs from outside Sandbox that become usable in Sandbox. Um, we have as well all the user rated content, what creator make with Vox Edit, mint on uh, the marketplace that can be used with a no-code game maker to build your own experiences. Soon creator can also like mint their own collection of equipment or avatar that's coming this year. And you have Sand, which is also not an NFT, but it's also an important part of the Sandbox ecosystem. It's a utility token that uh, power our platform, allowing uh, users to buy land, to participate in the creator economy. Creators are uh, like being paid in sand as people buy their content on the marketplace. And users who engage in various events, complete quests, earn sand as well. But I think sand is much more than like the only the token for the sandbox platform. Uh, we are known as one of the top metaverse token and top gaming token between top 50 and top 100 on um, coin market cap with uh, like sand is listed everywhere in the US, in Japan. In, it's the, one of the only 20 tokens listed in Japan, in Korea, in Europe. And we're starting to see other games, other applications and even uh, real uh, IRL events accept sand as a mean of payment mm -hmm. or to attract their com our community of users to offer them various services. So it's exciting to see how Sand can also extend uh, and be uh, more adopted beyond just the Sandbox uh, game platform by itself. You mentioned the avatars and you talked about something key here, which is digital identity. Why is the concept of digital identity something that is so important to you? Oh, it's essential. I think like we, I think the ability to choose uh, your identity for the first time. Like when we are born in this physical world, we don't really get to choose who we are, where we are born, and that really will start to define a lot of things in our life, unfortunately. Like we inherit certain uh, culture, mm -hmm. uh, tradition, uh, the, our, our, our social uh, status and situation, mm -hmm. uh, and our access to certain opportunities, education, etc. We're quite conditioned by it. But in the metaverse, we can really choose who we want to be, whether it's a uh, male, female, or non-human, or non-gendered person. And we choose the community we belong to. So the digital asset that uh, we own also start to define which community uh, we are affiliated with. And we can build a new online reputation based on like the action we complete online, uh, like uh, as a creator, as a player, as a contributor on the sandbox, but also different platform. And uh, this digital identity can keep evolving. It doesn't age. Uh, people uh, can upgrade that avatar over time. It gets new emotes and animation. And uh, I think it's a great way for uh, people to feel like, uh, and actually studies show that more than 54% of uh, people who have an avatar in platform like Roblox, Fortnite, or Sandbox 
feel more themselves than in a physical world. So it's really interesting that how like we reappropriate ourselves, that identity, even if it's virtual. Why do you think it's the case? Well, I think like we uh, we're living in, in a society that's really putting a lot of pressure on like how we look and um, how like there's a lot of aspect to our like the vanity that's important. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we don't have a chance sometimes to be really included uh, as part of the conversation or we cannot really express like who we truly are because of like the various filters before, because of uh, how like we have fear of being judged by like our uh, surrounding environment, society, uh, school, work, Things we don't uh, we really related. choose, right? Exactly. Things that we don't really choose. The ability of choosing your uh, identity and building your reputation online, it's a new chance. Sometimes mm. I feel like we are reborn in the metaverse and then we can choose, of course, uh, hopefully like we, we choose to do um, great action, positive impact to drive a, a change that like basically give us a chance to be appreciated for who we truly are. And people are no longer judging us based only on our appearance, which is unfortunately still most of the case today, but by our action, how we contribute, how we build, how we bring value towards certain communities. So the digital identity would be a collection of NFTs that basically prove the things that you've done. Because one of them is definitely vanity. Your profile picture, I'm a bored ape or I'm a mm -hmm. crypto punk, or mm -hmm. it's not really different than the I real world, right? No, but then exactly. It would be, you, in the real would world, have other complements that would show what the, you've done. Yes, in um, so it's more than NFTs. It's more than only what we own that will define who we are. That's an important thing. I think it's, it's one step toward it. Definitely, what you own define like probably which community you belong to, your tastes. Um, and so I can choose to be part of the PUBG Penguins, which is a very family-friendly community, or I can be more around like board ape and have like a certain lifestyle associated with it, etc. A little bit like in the real world, I would choose to buy a Ferrari or a Renault car. Like both are cars, they have the same utility. You use them to drive. You probably cannot drive more than a certain speed in our uh, cities, but they reflect a certain social status and belonging or not, a notion of belonging toward the community of people who like those different cars. Which one is the Renault and which one is the Ferrari? The uh, Pudgy yeah. or the, uh -huh. the, yeah, the board A? <laughs> more complex than that. But, <laughs> but what's beautiful with blockchain is like our reputation is also based on like um, it's can be transparent and uh, it can be recorded on chain, like the different actions and contributions. So not just like the fact that we own, but also the fact that we completed certain quests in certain application. If you spend a hundred hours uh, a week playing a MMORPG like World of Warcraft, before, like all of that was not tracked anywhere. Mm. It was just reflected somehow in uh, the level of your avatar. But you could buy that from another account. So nothing really proved that it was actually you playing that. Now, if I'm an employer and I see, oh, that person is so dedicated and has been like actively, I don't know, like progressing, leveling up his avatar, and I have the whole history on chain proving that it's him, I can start like to derive a certain um, interpretation of his skill, of his dedication, and like define like those are potentially valuable skills for like the jobs of the future in a more digital uh, world and digital economy. And all of this moving on chain can be part of your reputation. You're basically, yeah, absolutely. You are, you're grasping value that was there, but that couldn't be valued before, right? I had this conversation with the co-founder of Swissborg and he was saying, mm -hmm. he was giving a, a Duolingo example, saying, hey, yes. look, we have one of our employees. He's, uh, he's done uh, 8,000 day days, right? Duolingo every day. Like, but the problem with Duolingo is, okay, maybe he has uh, some, you know, clappings or something, congratulations, you've done an 8,000 days trick, but this could be actually extremely valuable for, if you I mean, just like think about ma as NFT, absolutely, or, or, or just marketers you know. of other apps, right? Yeah. Knowing who is a top super user for some applications and who to target. And even personally, the fact that you're building these 
competencies and that are going to be valuable to one person or another or business or another can make a huge difference. Whereas in the Web2 world, it just, it's just lost in the mix, right? No one knows it and no one cares about it. Exactly. Like the information is only held by like the centralized company operating. And there's mm -hmm. a lot of like dormant data that's not being utilized or monetized. And I do believe that open ecosystem bring much more opportunity to grow value, to interpret uh, uh, the information that's available and to create new business model, new synergies, new way to target users and, and uh, to develop like, like this overall digital economy. Absolutely. We talked a bit about NFTs. Mm -hmm. we, we mentioned Bored Apes, Pudgy Penguins. Are NFTs dead? I think NFTs are far from that. Like NFTs are like a store of culture, which you, if you very often you compare like cryptocurrencies as top of store of value, NFTs are a store of culture. Is culture dead? No, culture keeps reinventing, regenerating. Sometimes uh, like uh, you have like collections of NFTs, like profile picture. Maybe that was one slice of what NFTs are. Like NFTs represent uh, uh, many different asset class, whether it's art, it's like virtual land, it's avatar, it's game item, it's um, a profile picture as well. Uh, it can be a music file, sounds file, and so on. Right now, like NFTs, NFT community really live through like the actions of their holders. Like stakeholders of NFTs are like the, for me, the, the living earth and body uh, like that make uh, a collection more or less or dead. If you talk about like just the trading activity, no, like there's still a large volume of NFT being traded, by the way. Like yeah, I think it just moved from certain marketplaces like OpenSea to what like now Blur mm. and other uh, Magic Eden, for example. But definitely, I think like, like saying NFT is dead is like saying like culture is dead. Like there's no way like NFT are dead. They are, NFT is just a technology. The content that's being pushed on you know, that technology might become obsolete at some point and still like you still own it you don't lose that ownership even if the collection is maybe less active at some point because uh, the people in charge of that project are less active and we are seeing that it's totally possible to have new owners or new community members that decide to revive a community you take Pugsy Penguin it's a great example mm -hmm. of communities that's been revived by a new team behind uh, there's so many opportunities what? to also target OGs or people say, oh, you know what? You were there in 2018. You already owned some early crypto kiddies. It's a skill or you're the right kind of user. So I'm going to actually offer you like a special benefit in my game. No more, not necessarily just whitelisting access like we are seeing now, but I'm going to allow you to turn all your crypto kiddies into a specific equipment or specific avatar in my game. We've seen those strategies applied uh, uh, quite often. And they are interesting, I think. And you don't uh, lose access of that content as a user. You don't lose your NFT. You just keep having like new utilities and new possibilities behind. We just have to keep educating developers and creators on how to best utilize existing and upcoming NFTs to attract users. What do you think about the Pudgy Penguin? I mean, Lucanet and Pudgy Penguins, because they're doing something different than other NFT collections. So maybe you can tell us what you think about what they're doing and then you can tell us what you think is the right way. Obviously there is things being tried, right? But what do you think is the right way to create a valuable NFT com community? I think there is, of course, not just one way to create a valuable uh, NFT community. We've seen like how Board Ape and then uh, the ApeCoin and the ApeCoin DAO ecosystem have evolved. Uh, we've seen our sandbox as well is evolving progressively, focusing on creators and user generated content while leveraging brands and having a very uh, cultural approach, very inclusive and global. And for Pugdy Penguin, what I, I think is I really uh, like to see is like their communities are always very friendly. They like to gather uh, in various uh, cities when there is a big conference. And they, they've succeeded into bridging toward Web2. So people say like a great way and once uh, 
uh, Web3 will become mainstream is when like we're able to onboard Web2 users. And PugDeep has like this cute character collection, those great positive value from the hold by their community. And the fact that they launched these physical toys and plushies that they sold at Walmart has definitely helped them to attract a lot of members. They also have a very um, a woman um, I, I would say more inclusive community that's more balanced in mm-hmm. uh, men and women uh, proportion, which I think is a great example of community that's not too elitist, not speculative, but focused on like, let's enjoy great moment together, support active action and like be inclusive. What do you think about, I had a, a conversation with the, the guy who created the Pepe NFTs a couple of years ago. Uh, and he was telling me, I mean, He created the Pepe NFTs a couple of years ago. We had this conversation maybe a month or two two months ago. And he told me that he believes he's a big fan of baseball cards, right? And the NFTs were basically baseball card on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. That's why he loved it. Mm -hmm. He's a big believer in CryptoPunks because there's no promise, right? But he was saying anything else that comes with a promise in terms of NFT should tend towards zero. Therefore, pudgy penguins that come... I mean, people in Pudgy will tell you, hey, Pudgy, there is no promise. It's just a penguin. But actually, there is a, one of the arguments or like one of the, the, the key strengths that people in the community talk about. And I'm a big Pudgy. I'm a holder. I'm a big believer. Um, I had Luca Nets on the podcast. He's coming back. But there is this Web2 aspect, right, that we think we can kind of tie value to, into, right? Mm-hmm. And what this guy is saying is that a real NFT that can become really valuable and stay valuable in time is one that has nothing behind it, just a community. What do you think about that? Well, I think like having a community, a holder, that if we take the example of CryptoPunks, it's more than just like a dormant NFT. It's still like, it's a symbol. It's historically one of the first collection. Mm-hmm. People put a lot of importance of like which was historically one of the first NFT collection, whether it's Autoglyph or the punks, fully on chain. And, and if the whole world decided that it doesn't matter anymore, I think punks will also drive down to zero and we would then care so much about the historical aspect of it, right? But they have a lot of annual gatherings, there's all this culture and merchandising that's drawn from like the punks that you own. Uh, they um, and I don't know, like they also enjoy some getting together and coming up with new project. So I believe it's, it's somehow like if that community didn't exist as well, like those assets will probably not like be as valuable as they are still today. However, I, I don't necessarily agree that a great NFT project is a project that has no uh, promise or no utility. On the opposite, I tend to think like the utility needs to be there and the team that will deliver on that promise needs to be solid enough to actually deliver on it. Not instantly, it mm-hmm. takes time to deliver, but if they constantly deliver the value and like they show that you can use this NFT for um, the purpose that they were initially meant for and maybe other uh, afterwards, then it's also a great uh, and probably a better commitment to keep attracting new entrants to be interested in owning them. The problem with punk is like they are not accessible at all mm-hmm. to anyone. So they are history, but they are like the worst example of an NFT if you want to onboard someone into the space. Like the price point is just incredible. Whereas at Sandbox, like we've been constantly delivering updates, we launch Avatar Collection, people can see uh, the content made by the creator, the utility of the land, and we work hard to on- keep onboarding new people and grow the overall market of like um, the, of web free holder, NFT holders. But by definition, I mean, Luca said on the podcast, he said the, the best NFT collection is the one that has the highest floor price. Basically, which means that if you're building the most successful NFT collection, you will have the highest floor price, which means that you will be not accessible, which you are saying. And actually, I also understand that it's not positive because it 
makes you inaccessible to the majority of the people, right? That's a, well, I love to differ, and uh, we, we can definitely have different opinions. Like, I think like there's been maybe too much focus on like the idea like the NFT needs to have like a, a value and maintain a, a floor price over time, given like having scarcity, having high demand versus low supply. For me, the best metric is like the number of holders, number of unique holders of a certain NFT, and that keep mm -hmm. And lodging. So if you take virtual land in sandbox, their floor price might vary. It's pretty stable over time, but the number of holders keep growing. And we work hard every time we introduce a new land sale that like only uh, you can only purchase one land. So one land NFT is one new owner, and we verify that through KYC. And that means that we're able to keep for offering the opportunity for new entrants to become landowners, to own an NFT and to access this opportunity. If quite interestingly, like why would they launch this uh, product of physical toy and have like an NFT, like digital twin associated with it into supermarket like Walmart, if they focus only on like uh, growing the floor price of like the limited supply. So, so like, like I wouldn't say it's best, it's a, it's It's definitely one metric that you can measure the success, but it's not necessarily the best. At least I differ on the interpretation of mm. it. One project that did really well last cycle, even flipped punks, right? I think shortly, Bored Apes. And now it's kind of like, at least for the moment, obviously we have these crypto cycles. That's the whole problem of the whole struggle of NFTs, right? We're following the crypto cycles, but everything is happening later mm -hmm. because usually... People make a lot of money on the coin, let's say ETH, and then to kind then of display like wealth, they'll start so buying exactly the NFT. Therefore, NFT will become very valuable late in the cycle, but we probably also bottom after the coins bottom, right? And so part of the problem in NFTs that we have now is probably also that, right? The main question is there's kind of like a lot of noise on Twitter. Do you think Bored Ape is a basically has been or is a big opportunity right now and why? I think the, the f first just getting back to the model like like NFT bottom when like uh, crypto as well then a little bit after and it's mm. it's not totally in phase but there is some correlation it's because the previous model was like you really like distribute NFT through like this premium people buy it at a certain price and then progressively the price will increase maybe following a bonding curve Now, like the most likely model for NFT collection to launch is actually free airdrop mm. to a lot of participants. And then later on, like the market will decide the, 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 the floor price and the market value on the second, secondary trades. And in that case, like it's a different opportunity that's new. Like you keep attracting new entrants, you keep... You, you're no longer correlating the value of the initial of the NFT initially with whatever the price of Bitcoin or ETH could be. And I think it's, again, it's an opportunity, like the technology uh, that, uh, that, that here NFTs and the technology is becoming dissociated to like the fluctuation of crypto markets. And that's a way to keep onboarding people, to attract them to play your game, to like uh, maybe be part of like this initial uh, community and become this ambassador. Some of the user, of course, will still be there for the speculative reason, try to sell it rapidly for a quick profit. Mm -hmm. But now like we also have this more, uh, this class of user who are here just like for enjoying the benefit of like, I own something, I can use it somehow it within a game, can give me access to something phys phys physically with a digital or virtually. And that's exciting. And so I, I, I I'm more positive on the idea that NFT will keep evolving. That's why like back to me, it's very far from that. Uh, like it's a, actually a very exciting, like, uh, test bed of experiment and, and like every day you find new project every day you find new ways to be engaged now like sometimes you have to stake in order to earn nfts mm. so the so new mechanics are, are being found uh broad ape i think like we've seen some change recently with the um, within the yuga lab team uh the ceo uh, has resigned the original founder of the project is back uh, in charge let's see what that leads to i feel like the community is still strong like they st are still um, they, they really initiated a big movement a big cultural movement 
and like I was saying before, well, like it's hard to kill culture. It always makes its comeback somehow. Mm. One of my best friends, he asked me something that made a lot of sense, especially from a normal person who kind of understand crypto, but not that much. We would call them like a normie, right? He asked me, he said, if you launch a, you build a crypto project, I understand at some point you launch a coin, fine, or an NFT. But why would an NFT launch a token? For example, why would Bored Ape launch Ape Coins? And maybe as part of that question, there was a tweet from a seed phrase, one of the big NFT guys, right? Said maybe a month or two ago that he thinks that the big NFT wave is going to come from NFT projects launching tokens. So maybe f first question is why would an NFT project launch a coin? I think like NFT project, like once they have a community and they want to build a, a roadmap of product, they want also like have a more diversified economy. Like if the only way to build an economy is to rely on like the trade and uh, of your asset and potentially the royalties that you earn from uh, like people trading those assets. It's, it's it's becoming more and more challenging, specifically now that like Blur and Order have like really broken the the, the promise like royal you will earn royalties. We've seen that big decline, right? So it's been a, over the last year uh, one of the main challenge that uh, many NFT project and collection have been facing. A token is an instrument uh, here. A utility token will serve many purposes that allow like to reward the NFT holder for participating more actively. So instead of keep distributing new NFTs, you can distribute a token, which has probably more uh, liquidity, can also be staked, can be exchanged, uh, can access like all the possibilities around like decentralized finance and essentially can allow to build a more uh, granular economy around. And that's what we've seen with um, ApeCoin like the ape coin was rewarded to the holder of the ape and then after like the ape coin dao became uh, like one of the reference daos that uh, like people can submit this um, uh, proposal the aip and people can vote upon them to support the growth of the and the various initiative of the community and you can still own your apes you can still engage with the different um, games and products um, without necessarily using the ApeCoin at all, but it's also a great instrument for distributing reward, building loyalty, creating engagement, and, and driving further uh, the economy uh, of the world, uh, of that world. And I think it's very inspired to our physical world. Like, why is, is ownership of your car, of your house, of your land sufficient? No, you still have, like, the dollar and the euro, and you need a currency that you act upon, that you can earn based on your work, your labor, that you can distribute, and that allows you to develop an economy of service and activity on top of it. If I challenge maybe a bit this tweet, right, which is this new, because it makes a lot of sense, right? An NFT project would just say, if you think short term, how do I incentivize people to buy my NFT? I'll launch a, a coin, and if you're NFT holder, you'll get some free money, right? So it could be, I understand the aspect of I'm going to create an entire economy, I need more liquidity, I maybe don't want to dilute my NFT holders by creating new NFTs. Mm -hmm. But there's also a big risk, especially in crypto, where it's a very opportunistic industry, right? That a lot of these uh, NFT collections, if it's what happens, right? We have the tokens that are launched. It's kind of like, it could be felt if we're very honest with ourselves with, I don't know what else to do anymore. My last chance, or let's say my easy chance to get people interested is to say that we're gonna launch a token if you hold the NFT, which people, again, is the same as when you do an airdrop, right? I mean, not all the airdrop, but most of the airdrop is, if you use my protocol, I'll give you some money. Obviously, the airdrop, you have to kind of game the thing so you don't really know how it's gonna happen work and, and actually it's today we see that often the ones who contribute a lot to the protocol don't earn that much but an nft holder 
will earn much more, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that's another kind of topic that we could basically just after it, after it's that. It's a question about like tokenomics and which of like the different stakeholder of your project you want to reward most. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, often the decision goes to the NFT holders because like they somehow hold the power by maintaining the floor price, you know? And like, if you associate your success to uh, like the floor price, yes, then you make, you give them more power actually mm. through that. Um, I think like, like we, we've seen various experiment. I'm thinking about CloneX. CloneX basically, like if you hold the NFTs and you can the capsule, if you hold a capsule and you come to engage, you, you earn like different components. And at the end of the day, like it becomes more and more, more complex through a long funnel. If you own a series of NFTs, you can start minting your shoes and have the chance maybe to buy one of very, very cool Nike uh, pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. I found it way too complex. Like if you didn't follow the whole thing and the story, etc., cetera, you, you get totally lost into that space. Currency is still something, a token is something very comprehensible. Everyone understand like a currency and understand that it can be used for being spent, it can be used for being held, and it will have some form of utility. Now, um, if you just launch a token and you have like a short vesting schedule, because that usually is very associated with this idea like, oh, it will be locked, but you know, not too long, so you can sell it early on. Like, we, we all know where it goes. We know that like those projects will not survive the next uh, crypto winter or hard cycle, and it will create a lot of selling pressure, which is like not great for many projects. So I don't want to generalize. I think it's every project they have some teams. Some of those teams are very legit. They are building real product, real services. They have real community. We and uh, you have probably the chance to interview the founders behind them. So. I think you're contributing to select which project are the most like reputable and seem to, to build with a real good intention to deliver something behind. And those are the ones that I recommend to always do your own research to check the quality of the community, what they are talking about. If they only talk about floor price and price of token, that's not a good signal. That means they are more interested by the speculation and financial aspect than necessarily what the game or the platform of the product itself. And, uh, and and like look at what they ship progressively over time, mm -hmm. and then based on that make your own decision and uh, based on your risk appetite. Maybe a last question about NFTs is, why does it make so much sense? We've seen that more and more lately, for a project launching a token to airdrop a, a bunch of the tokens to an, one of the top NFT collections, such as Mad Lads, Pudgy Penguins. Mm -hmm. What's the advantage? That, why do they do that? I think it's, uh, well, it's a strategy. It's been, we've seen that before. Uh, pro, pro, we, we call it like vampiric attack in a way. In a way, like, like but, but joke apart, like if you want to uh, attract other uh, users and community, indeed, like offering them uh, the token because they are holding certain NFT collection that you feel valuable. So in a way, targeting them is a new user acquisition model. It's a new acquisition model. They will receive some token, and then it's up to them first, uh, the, the board app owner, etc., to decide if like they uh, are interested in like using that token or not, and uh, if they see any benefit or they're attracted. And, and in a way, it's probably better to distribute the value toward the users rather than to the user acquisition platform, like we've seen before in Web two, like before as a creator of a project, as a developer, even if I earn 70% uh, of the revenue from my in-app purchase, actually I had to spend pretty much half of it into user acquisition. And that user acquisition money actually goes back to the App Store, the Google Play Store, the YouTube, which is, et cetera. Exactly, which is why Facebook and those now, companies are so big. Exactly. Now that value goes back into the end of users. Mm. And the user have the power to decide if they want to use those tokens, they want to hold them, they want to sell them, they want to do nothing with it. It's what? exciting, but it's also create new challenges and new questions. What's your main focus right now besides the sandbox? 
Well, I think like Sandbox is probably going to keep taking a lot of my time and energy. Uh, we we think like this is still the early days of building the open metaverse and the creator economy. We're really excited that we just passed a thousand experiences on the uh, live on the map. But our goal is definitely to launch Sandbox in beta and the public version and to keep pushing that vision of like creating a very social, immersive uh, virtual world where we can play with friends, create with friends, own our digital asset and use official NFTs from various brands to co-create with them. That's uh, something like really uh, that we push starting this year, being able to co-create with your favorite brands and be recognized by them, publish on their land. is very attractive. So it will probably take us five to 10 more years to build the full vision of what we want and keep iterating until like nobody uh, uh, doubt anymore that like this is the right way to approach the creator economy to reward the creator and to build a new virtual world and beside that uh, very excited to support the ecosystem through the uh, the blockchain game alliance that team mm. is doing uh, the, the team of the blockchain game alliance is doing an amazing job at supporting educating uh, showcasing the work from the the whole game blockchain gaming industry and we're proud to have 600 members now and keep growing. They are present here at Token 2049 in Dubai. And uh, also, like, always looking to see how I can support other uh, uh, projects, uh, maybe, like, like uh, helping them by owning their own NFT in Sandbox, creating new synergies if they own a land and we can uh, build interoperability with their NFT, their community can be uh, benefit from, like, the creative possibility of Sandbox, creating their own stories, their own experience, their own adventures. Um, yeah, like how we can grow the network effect in Web3 all together. Invested in a lot of companies. I read more than 50. So it, I think it's also important like to share the knowledge and it's more than investment. I think like important, it's more like being an advisor or like helping project to think the right way and hopefully to understand like tokenomics and web free and, and how we can support each other following this guiding principle that uh, we, we talked a little bit uh, before earlier rather than fall f too fast into like the speculative or financial aspect only. That's a, one important thing that uh, I try to support. What's something that you believe in that most people don't agree with today, but that will look obvious in hindsight in a couple of years? Uh, of, of <laughs> a few things. Well, I, I do believe like that. Um, well, like uh, true digital ownership is essential. Like I cannot believe like how we've built the internet and we all satisfied ourselves that anything, any digital content is not ours. All our work and our time spent online is not variable. And because it's been so for 20 or 30 years, it's just fine to keep on going. So for me, it's, it's just like... Uh, Wow, like now that we have technology to change that, like this is a new model and that Gen Z, they understand it much better than we do. And you will be surprised like when like they will ask us in 10 years, like, but how, uh, grandpa, <laughs> you want, how did you even live in a world where your asset didn't belong to you and you couldn't use them where they want and sell them how you want it, right? I also believe that like uh, creator, the creator economy will uh, like keep growing and like there's no future of gaming without user generated content like any hit title any game at some point will enable users not only to make their own characters or level but will allow like really openly to create uh, like their content to contribute actively and reward the users so any player can become a creator and like, it will become more and more both roles become blended i think is important and ultimately, I feel like um, there needs to be a recognition globally of that status of creator. And like I'm, I'm looking forward for the first nation in the world that will give properly the importance to recognize that status of like being a digital creator and the fact that you earn an income from creating content in virtual world and metaverse is actually uh, an activity that you, that you can declare and then you can live from. What's your biggest prediction for the next 12 months? Well, um, I feel like it's really exciting, the space again, like blockchain gaming. Uh, I, I still believe like uh, gaming is going to be the main driver of adoption. There's new uh, 
ways to look at like um, the whole industry. Like I've seen ordinals, mm -hmm. quite interesting. What the movement, the committee they're gathering, how they are launching things. We're seeing meme coins. We can debate on the value of meme coin. Maybe that's for our next episode. We, uh, we might not have time. I have an entire but... chapter on the meme coins, actually. <laughs> ah, okay, okay. <laughs> but but it's uh, like um, it's it's a little bit like how uh, pop culture has taking off. Start first from the streets and then not becoming mainstream. So maybe that's uh, the unexplored way and an unsuspected way that they will actually drive more adoption forward, like toward the industry. Um, and they start as a, uh, their own beasts <laughs> and they become something after community product and so on. We've seen that before with Dogcoin, Shiba, etc. Um, so, so it's still a very exciting year of experiments. Maybe as a closing question, because we're getting towards the end uh, of the time, meme coins. I know Yatsu is very, I mean, two, th two three years ago, he was talking a lot about social tokens, right? Mm -hmm. And one thing that I, one question I think makes a lot of sense here regarding meme coins is, are meme coins what social tokens could have been? Or is it possible, or in another way, to make it more personal to you, what's different between, what's the difference between uh, Sa Sabustian Borja meme coin, right? And your social token. What's the difference? Well, um, I, I'm actually very much in the middle of that social experiment. I started and I launched a SEP token, mm -hmm. <laughs> which like I think has 10 billion SEP supply and it's distributed uh, for free only to holders of uh, sandbox NFT without any promise of any kind of utility or value. And I just was looking at like, okay, what happened if like I introduce it and what would people want to do with it? And it's um, it's been quite interesting, like just rewarding a few like, human interaction, meeting at conferences, having taken a selfie with me will give you like a hundred SEB uh, for free. And people really enjoy that. And it creates like a, a on-chain proof of our interaction. It creates also like different ways to engage and people then start to wonder uh, uh, indeed like how they can uh, utilize it in many ways. So there is um, probably something that Seb can do. Like I still don't know what, but I'm happy and taking a lot of uh, input about that. And it's the beginning of like, if instead of just thinking about SEP, but any single creator has its own digital currency, its mm -hmm. own social currency in the metaverse. You are an owner, you publish an experience and you launch your own social token that you can use to engage and reward your community of players. That's for me, something that I really want to uh, understand better so that to see like if that's one of the direction that Sandbox should go or not. And is there like Seb with hat and other meme coin? Maybe the community <laughs> will, they, again, going back to culture, like you don't control everything. And like we've seen how like um, art or content really like get copied, replicated, reproduced, altered until it becomes its own, uh, uh, like Nyan Cats, for example. We've seen all of that before. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows exactly, right? Amazing. Thank you so much for doing that, Seb. That was awesome. Of course, my pleasure. Looking forward to speak again in a few months, I guess, as a follow-up. Absolutely. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.